camera. It is March 14th, 2017. We are in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida with Kenneth Steele and we're continuing our interview from yesterday. So the question we kind of talked a little bit about the changes that you noticed from your visit, return visit to Goodrum House in 2015 from the time that you actually lived there in the 30s and 40s. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the major changes were that you that you uh, remember? Gosh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, there's a lot of changes that I noticed, uh, probably that I only I would notice. But remember, I lived there for about 10 years and I was there every day virtually. And so it was my home and I enjoyed it very much. It was a fantastic estate that was maintained by two full-time gardeners, uh, Albert Hall and Mr. Holloway. And uh, the place was so maintained, as you walked around, there was no such thing as a leaf on the ground. They cleaned the property every day to a state of perfection. And uh, everything was well maintained. Uh, some of the changes I saw were back by the pool. The, the fish pond at its peak is not at all like it was when I came back for the look. In its glory, and there are some pictures of it, it had lily pads, it had frogs, it had big goldfish, and it was maintained and it was like a work of art. <coughs> what did it look like when you returned in 2015? Uh, I think it was not, maybe not even operating, but I'm not sure. I, I don't I think it was. I think it had and I talked about it was a project of his to, I believe it is back with the fish now, and that was a big thing. And uh, that part of the property, to me, is a big thing because <coughs> the owner of the property, May Goodrum, uh, Abri Abria, <coughs> that she stayed in that part of the house, the back part of the house. And in the summertime, there's a screen porch out there, and she was out there a lot. So <coughs> we always gave her a lot of privacy and didn't interrupt her or bother her because that was her domain. Uh, second big thing is <coughs> when I lived there uh, in the front yard, there were many huge, what I would call oak trees. And to a large degree, they are gone now. And I was surprised because I thought those trees live forever, but they probably have a 80 year life or something like that. But I think Tad says they're on the way to coming back. Something like that. <clears throat> Another thing was in the days of uh, before Mrs. Goodrum married Mr. Bria, in front of the little house that Mrs. Goodrum built for Clara and myself, uh, there was a special, it was called the maze. And I didn't know it at the time until 50 years later when Tad sent me an aerial drone picture. It was in May's initials, but no one, you couldn't see it. First, it had, the institution, the historic institution that bought it from the Rushtons, they ripped it out and used the, that area for parking. Is that what it is today? Nope, we've it's, returned it oh, back. That's right, it's coming back, it's coming back. Another major change is the entire half of the property was sold off and it's fenced off now and blocked off. And uh, you, 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 If you walked on the property as a total stranger, you would get a completely different opinion because it was a, a gigantic property in its day. And today it's half of that. And they've allowed it to grow up. Can you talk a little bit about what was on the back of that property and how you used to use that portion of the property? Yeah, that was my area. I was a little boy and I had my own personal woods and I played back there and I invited other Buckhead boys to come over and visit me and we would play over there in those woods or we would go across to the Kaiser lot and play football over there. I had a bow and arrow and I had a BB gun and we little boys do those things and uh, we did that. And uh, for some reason, first I, I climbed every tree there was that could be climbed because that's what little boys do. And near the, our house, the little house, 
there was a huge pine tree, which is no longer there, right next to the house. And I decided to hang a bell at the top of it. So somehow I got a small bell, and I climbed to the top of the tree and tied it down securely so that when the wind blows, it tinkles. So my mother, this is when I'm what, 15, 16 years old, my mother would bring me my dinner plate, my me evening meal, my mother would bring a dinner plate from the house down for my dinner. And uh, as she would pass, she would hear the bell ring. So in later years when I was away as a Marine in World War II in the Pacific, uh, fighting the war, uh, Clara would go down to the little house. She said every time she would walk by there, the uh, bell would ring and it would remind her of her son. And so, so it was a nice thing. <laughs> and when I went back, your original question, uh, what were the changes? The bell had long since, the tree had rotted and the bell had disappeared, but something between a, when a mother and a son. Beautiful. Any other memories that you have of the house that you want to share with us? Well, let's do the big house. I don't think I ever saw May and Francis in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> she did I, not cook. I think my mother, I think one of the things about getting me and getting the house, little house built was that Mince Clara worked 24 hours a day. And she was really, the word workaholic was 50 years in the future. Clara just worked all the time. And then in, in, uh, there's a letter from May to Mrs. Minaboni. And it, Clara had just died. And she tells in there how she feels about Clara. And she, she talks about uh, those things. How there's a lot of work to be done on keeping an estate like that up. And Clara took care of all of that. She was a, after Molly Patterson died, and that was my mother's job, looking after Mrs. Patterson, she was, had no duties but May wanted to keep her. So instead of May running the house, she transferred, you, you run things. So May had her personal life, which she was able to do. And then my mother take care of the rest of it. But both those ladies run, ran all those things without any apparent motion. They were both efficient, very efficient workers and planners and everything got done and you never saw any motion, it just every, one thing, they were, you know, in the Marine Corps, we officers, we give a lot of thought to leadership. You know, you don't have to, in the, when you see the movies about military people, there's a lot of orders. Say, That's an order, and ordering people around. But, but in the real work a day of the military, you, everyone knows what has to be done, and you don't have to yell or, or do anything like that. A lot of military movies are always yelling some kind of an order. I never yelled at them another Marine in my life. And I was a Marine for 14 years. Why do I want to yell? <laughs> it's, it's, the, the movies give a very distorted view of what life in the military is like. But anyway, what I'm drifting at is that uh, trying to get to is in the Minimboni letter, she, which Taz has, uh, uh, she makes the case that I've lost my dear friend Clara in some affectionate words which I don't all recall, and stating how she got everything done around there for me. And she took things that I didn't have to do. So it was a nice part of the memorabilia for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the role of Coca-Cola, it's uh, one way you want to visualize this property is you, it's based on Coca-Cola. The only product of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola company now has many products, but in the 1930s it had one product, a five cent Coca-Cola Coke that you bought one at a time. Buying a six pack of Coke was really a big deal. Didn't do that very often. Uh, 
there were some, I don't even really remember Cokes being in the icebox. They probably were there. But one thing people didn't, no one on the property, was, we were servants. Servants did not freely uh, drink Cokes. Where today we would, I think. Uh, a five cent Coke doesn't seem to have much value. But in those days, we, I think we looked at it as this is part of the, the Goodrum property. And we are here to safeguard the property and to care for it and make it make their life easier. So uh, we ate in the uh, once my mother a significant thing. There are pictures that show at some point May and Clara became close, and Clara, who had always worn a white uniform in the early years. That was dropped, and she began to wear maize clothes. So that was a change. Once I came on the property, some kind of metamorphosis, metamorphosis uh, took place. Is how are they going to look at me? Uh, I was definitely the child of the servant. Clara was a servant. And Clara always ate with the family, every meal. When it was breakfast time, she sat down with them and was were one of the family. And when I moved on the property, so did I. And I had free run of the house. And I just think that's unusual. I don't think you could find any other properties where. So this was about trying to reinforce somehow or another the grand dom of Atlanta society. Uh, developed an affection for a servant, which is, seems like you could write a book about that. Do you want to talk a little bit about what happened after the Korean War? And Sure, although, and, and we certainly don't have to do this, but I wondered if you wanted to talk just briefly about how you found out that your mother had passed away and what that was like, that, that raw period when, after you lost her. Yeah. The death of my mother, we don't know a lot about it. But uh, I was just, my mother died in 1947, and it was basketball season, and I was a student at Oglethorpe University, and uh, I'd never played basketball. I was 21 years old, I guess, 22. and But it is a great game, so I, I, I never, no experience. They had a varsity team, but I, didn't know anything about basketball, so I played on the B team. And we uh, had road games, and we, we played the preliminary game before the varsity Oglethorpe game. And that night we had a game downtown Atlanta. I'm not sure who we were playing. Ted, Ted found it in the paper. Amazing. He's an amazing researcher. So I was up in the stands. And uh, remember, this is nine, ten o'clock at night, and uh, we're at a college basketball game, a festive thing, college students going to their own school's basketball game, and someone came, found me in the crowd, and said, you have a phone call in the stadium. So someone at 320 had found the phone number, had called to Oglethorpe, found somebody out there that told him I was at this game and they got the phone number of the auditorium, how they did that. They found me in the crowd. They got a taxi cab for me and drove me. That was my first time ever in a taxi cab. <laughs> drove me home and uh, walked me into, I can't remember who was there in particular. I think, I just think it was Aunt Ruth. Aunt Ruth was a Mrs. Ruth Roberts who was a, not a blood relative of the family but for all practical purposes, she was just as much a family. Once you were adopted into that family, you were treated very well, and uh, there was no distinction of any kind. So they walked me in the front door and into the little powder room and uh, told me that my, they, over the phone they'd said, your mother is sick or something like that, and you come home. So they took me upstairs, and but she had already died, and uh, 
That's the last time I saw my mother in the upstairs bedroom. It was a big, a big loss. It upset the whole family because she and May were the spiritual hearts of the, everything that went on in that house was about these two women. So everything changed after that. There was that left me and my brother and Clara's husband, Bob Cody. <coughs> so um, we lost our mother. And <coughs> who's a new mother? Everybody's mother. We, 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 he's such a special person. Your loss, I'm sure, was magnified because they were all mourning her too. I'm sure that must have been a, a tough period for all of you. And May counted on her to do, get everything done and uh, so she could have her own life and do things and go places and everything is okay at the house. The other thing I thought that I would mention, we, we talked briefly yesterday about your time in Korea, uh, that you got a commission in the regular officers, Marine Corps, which was unusual. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences in <coughs> Korea and how that differed from World War II? That was very soon after the end of World War II, and I'm sure that there were, what were your thoughts as you, as you did that? Thank you. Um, Yes, uh, that was a, I was a commissioned in August of 1949, the same day I graduated from Southern Methodist University. The Marine Corps prefers to have all of its officers be, be, have a college degree. And then every year they recruit about 100 young men and send them to a special school. And you go, at, you, you are our commission, you have your bars, but for nine months they send you to a hard training school, second lieutenant school, and mainly, mainly to be an infantry officer, to lead Marines in combat, nose to nose with the enemy. So we did that, and it, it was, uh, this has to do with the Korean War. One week after we graduated a brand new class of second lieutenants for the year 1950, uh, one week after that, the Korean War started, and half of our class were sent over, a brand new second lieutenant, were sent over to fight this war, just like that. Uh, they'd hardly graduated, and the Marine Corps had to build a whole new unit uh, called the 1st Provisional Brigade, which went to Korea and fought. The Korean War, we lost that war for a long time. And the Marine Corps landed after the North Koreans came down the Korean Peninsula all the way to the t just a tiny beachhead. And uh, it was a very bad situation. Well, almost, they almost all got captured. And then we, the Marine Corps was asked to conduct an amphibious operation to come back and cut them all off, which they did successfully. But later on, my classmates, who I was talking about, they got caught in, in the worst thing, worst battle in the history of the Marine Corps was uh, we had a whole Marine division up in the mountains, up in the Korean mountains, and it was uh, November, December, and it's minus 20 degrees. And they didn't have winter clothing, and they were almost all caught, but they fought their way out. And I could have been there very easily, but it was decided to send me to tank school, and I, where I learned my tanking. But uh, that, uh, that was a very, I, no one would have wanted to go, because you can't imagine that kind of cold, and you had improper footwear, and uh, just, it took them 10 days to get out of there. They had to fight their way out. It's a very famous battle, but uh, the, ac the actual military report by the commanding general of the Marine Corps, uh, he wrote it afterwards, said these conditions, in November, December in the North Koreans is not suitable for combat operations. That it's just too cold. You can't function. The human animal can't function. Yet those men were sent up there. Their government, those men didn't want to go up there, those Marines. They, they joined the Marine Corps and they sent them into an impossible situation. Even just surviving in 20 degrees below zero, it's impossible. That's too cold. So that was a big, I, I missed that. And uh, the Korean War went on for three years 
and I trained to be a uh, qualified tank officer. It's called 1802 in the uh, Marine Corps. You have to be qualified in your specialty or they don't let you loose with all that. It's very heavy, dangerous equipment and we're responsible for it all. So uh, I, I fought in the, uh, as a tank officer in uh, Korea for 14 months in 1951-52. How was it different from World War II? It, what, were there differences? Were there, how did, how did the, the close proximity and time from the one conflict to the next affect you all? Well, I don't know that I can do very well with that, but I will make a try. Uh, my first reaction is that if you are a, uh, the average grade, uh, remember I told you yesterday there were 16 million people in uniform. And the average age, this is, you can Google it up, it's a standard statistic that's always true in wars, American wars, the average age of the entire United States military in our wars is 19 years old. <laughs> wartime has, doesn't have, you can't, being an older person in a war, it's, you just body, they body, young people can take, they can take anything. So you've got to be really young to be in the infantry. <laughs> so uh, the big thing that I remember was if you, we lost, we lost America, let's put it this way, the Japanese and the Germans prevailed in the early years of the war. They had better military than we did. Their, their fighter planes were better, their bombers were better, their submarines were better, everything was better, and it took us years to learn to make new torpedoes and new radar had to be invented and uh, all kinds of things had to be invented. And, and, and the, the back home, the women went into the factories and, and do things there. But the biggest thing was uh, on your question, once you went to the combat zones as one of these 19-year-old people to fight the Zor, the army went to Europe. We fought it in two fronts. Uh, you're not supposed to fight a war on two fronts. You're supposed to fight on one front, and you concentrate your effort there. But somehow or another, um, the American industry arose and built plants. Atlanta had something they call the Bell Bomber Plant in Marietta. They, they built bombers there. And Bob Cody, Claire's husband, uh, he went to Portland, Oregon to build ships because he was a, a uh, professional electrician. But once you went, these 19-year-old people, the soldiers went to Europe and the Marines went to the Pacific, you stayed there. Where in, in World War, uh, in the Korean War, that, that war lasted three years and when you went over, you, you, if you're a Marine, you served 14 months and then you went back home. So I went back after doing my 14 months in Korea in the early years of that war fighting my tank platoon and uh, we had an M26, an M46 tank, a uh, 90 millimeter gun. We came back to America and because of my experience they put me into the office of training school where I, be, I went on the faculty of uh, at Quantico where we taught brand new second lieutenants how to be uh, an officer in combat. I did that for a few years. Do you have any overriding memories of Korea? Any significant experiences that you had? Well, the particular battle, which is, uh, I wrote it up in the uh, Marine Corps Gazette, and Tad has a copy if you want. It's, it was an all-day battle. Uh, again, it, instead of minus 20, it was about plus 10 degrees temperature. M me and uh, my tank and one other tank, we went on a caper, we called it. We went on a mission and uh, enemy territory one uh, marine rifle squad, I think, and uh, two tanks. And uh, during the snowstorm, the enemy came and put mines out in the road during the night, and we didn't know about it. And so we ran over the mine, and it blew the track off our tank, and we're in enemy territory, and there's nobody <laughs> there to help us. <laughs> and when your track You've got 50 tons of dead weight that won't move, and I've got five men in there that I'm responsible for, and the enemy's up there looking down at us and sh shooting at us and <laughs> hitting our tank all the time. So, uh, our, and our radios went out, 
<laughs> radios didn't work in those days. In, in movies, the radios always work. <laughs> in combat, they almost never work. <laughs> so um, that was a 12 hour, 12 hours we were in our town. You asked me what I remember. My most vivid was I had a wonderful group of 25 enlisted Marines, uh, and I was the officer. Being a lieutenant is a big deal in the Marine Corps. You, you got your platoon. You train to, to lead Marines in combat. That's what we all want to do. Not many people can do that. And we're willing to take the training and the suffering and sleeping in the cold. I slept under my tank at zero temperatures. Uh, we wanted it because we love our country and that sort of thing. So being a, uh, having the honor of leading a group of uh, 25 Marine tank boys uh, to uh, fight the enemy and uh, getting through that particular caper. Well, I remember that. How did you get out? <laughs> How do we get out? Well, the first thing, we were in a very dangerous position. The enemy, during the, they tried to knock us out. They sent infantry soldiers down to jump on a tank, and uh, we shot them all. And so they decided not to do that. We had two machine guns working uh, and our 90 millimeter cannon. And one enemy got as close as 30 meters away and uh, we shot him right in the head with a cannon. It would have been, I turned that into a lighthearted, uh, it, was e it would be easy to panic in that situation. We're five men in a tank, it's 10 degrees outside, we're out there for 12 hours, no meal, no bathroom. There's a tank is that close to your head, you can't move, can't get out of your seat. And so the enemy is trying to get inside our tank and kill us. So I had to turn it into a light situation and we made a lot of humor. We had a lot of jokes out there and had fun. So that's the way to do it. I don't want, I don't want anybody to get, get upset over it. They think they're going to kill us, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so it's, it's a great, it was a great honor to be, uh, we feel, uh, Marine Corps lieutenants feel they're very privileged to, you know, they make a big deal about being a quarterback in football. Well, we're, we're the quarterback for 25 men in a combat situation that my country put me there. They, they sent me on that mission. I didn't say, oh, I want to go in enemy territory in a tank and run over a mine. I didn't want that. I'd rather be back reading a magazine. But my country sent me out there and, and we took uh, great pride in doing our job. And when we came back, oh, how did we get out? Uh, the infantry was, I had a, at least a, probably a squad, maybe a platoon of infantry with me. My friend, uh, Kurt Gager, Kurt Gager, Second Lieutenant Kurt Gager, he was the infantry officer with us. So we had about uh, 30 or 40 Marine ground troops protecting our tank, and but when the enemy began to shoot, they hit us many times with mortar shells. That I, I told Kurt, uh, we had a little radios with the worked. Plus, also we had a telephone on the back of the tank. I think that's how he came up and talked to us. I told him to take the men back, because uh, take the infantry back, and we'll just stick it out alone because it's too dangerous. That so we're gonna. I don't want to get all those infantry marines hit because they couldn't, the enemy had us dead to rights there. We were in enemy territory and they knocked our, t they, they had us in a perfect position to kill us all and we weren't going to let that happen. So uh, when Kurt went back, Lieutenant Gager went back, uh, he called the, uh, we have a, we call it a rescue tank. It's called a retriever tank. Uh, it's, a, it's a tank with the gun taken off, but it's got all the pulling power and it's got a boom on it. And they sent that up the trail to where we were and a Marine, remember the enemy shooting at us with cannons and mortars and hitting all around us. I remember looking out of my vision port, it would just be black with the dirt coming up, the, the, land, the animal shells, the shells landing all around us. But anyway, a sergeant, uh, Pots call, crawled under the tanks so he wouldn't be hit, and he came up under our tank. Remember, the, the, the clearance is only about that. And we have a little trap door there, and we opened it up, and Sergeant Potts, who had been 
my platoon sergeant before. And he was now working in the rear. When he heard that we were in trouble, he demanded to be put in charge of that tank to come up and rescue us. This is liable to upset me. But he volunteered to do that. Anyway, I said, all right, how do you want to do it? He said, well, we'll back, my tank, back the retriever tank up to your tank, and I'll hook up the, the chains, and we'll drag you out. I said, okay. So that's what we did. So it took about an hour of dragging us backward. Remember our tracks, one track is on, the other track is blown off, so you can't steer. 50 tons of dead weight, and cliff off to one side, snowing, 10 degrees. We've been out there 12 hours. It's dark, and they drag us back. We could have just as easily slipped off, and we wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> so we got back safely, but th the big thing, that when the men, we slept that night. The next morning, we got up and fixed the track. <laughs> now, that was the end of our story. Just another day's work. But it was a big day. I remember that day. But we did, we were, you know, when you your time overseas, you do 14 months at a time. That was your question, what's the difference? But the, in World War II, when you went overseas, in the movies, they have these guys coming back in their uniform and going to see the girls. Uh -uh. You were overseas, you stayed there till the war was over. That was a long time. About the property, one thing I thought I would throw in, you asked for Chino about the, the biggest differences. There was a Mrs. Goodrum and the landscape architects, Mr. Shetsy and so on, they built a magnificent flower garden and they maintained that all the time. And they did that with a greenhouse. Even in the winter, they, they, when they get anything, at, whenever they could, the flower, they picked flowers that or plants that work well, and they, that's what Albert and Mr. Holliger did. They, they were worked in the greenhouse in bad weather, and created plants, pots of plants, and then carried the pots of the plants on good weather. And so that that was like a the supply. So it was always the there the, the property was seen to be committed to having a beautiful garden, and two people working there. I know, I wanted to talk to you about your relationship with the other servants as you being a child. And do you want to tell a little bit about the Sea Island kayak <laughs> and how that, how that came about and who made that for you? And Okay, thank you uh, for that, Barbara. Uh, Barbara mentioned a kayak. Uh, somehow or another, the idea of a kayak, the, the kayak is not in any way connected to the south. Up north they have rivers with rocks and streams. You don't find those in Atlanta, Georgia. Somehow or other, the, uh, somebody on that property, might have been me, I don't know. There was a servant named George who was, they, I, I was a very close friend with all the black people. They, were, they raised me to a certain to some degree. Claire was really working. I didn't spend a lot of time. I spent more time with the servant than with my mother, even though we were on the same property. And George was a great man manual craftsman, and he decided he was going to build it for me. We were going to build Kenny Boy a kayak. And in the little house out back, there's a groove walkway that leads into the basement. And that was where our shop, we built it out of doors. George, without any, virtually no equipment, you know, if you look at a kayak, it's a very special design. It's not like a rowboat. It has stringers running up and has canvas. Oh, he did all that without any written plans. And when it was all done, we loaded it into the back of a station wagon, took it down to the railroad station in downtown Atlanta, and put it on a train and shipped it to Sea Island. <laughs> and then we, then we went and tried it out, <laughs> and uh, it worked, it worked fine. But you know, a, a kayak in the swamps of Brunswick, Georgia, <laughs> wasn't really what you needed was a, a rowboat. <laughs> but nothing much came of that, but 
It gives me an example to so, show one thing about the times and the, the relationship that servants had with the uh, well-to-do people who lived in West Paces Ferry. I think my mother and the servants, the servants would be George and the uh, cooks, and, and, and they all had authority to go into all the Buckhead stores and buy things on credit. Not for themselves, but for the house. I think, the, by the way, right across the street from uh, one, the America, did your, is your office 130 West Paces Ferry Road? Yes. Do you know what was across the street when I lived there? A lumber yard and a plumbing supply house, which was completely empty. Nobody was, you never saw anyone in those places, but the lumber yard. So I think that George walked into the lumber yard and said, I'm, I'm George Davis from Mrs. Goodrum, and, and uh, I want her account. I want, I want this, this piece of lumber for this boat. And he'd walk out, and then he, he built it. But I think uh, the servants, any of the servants could walk in. The, the, the rich people apparently all had credit accounts in all the stores, including downtown. When you look at pictures of me as a little, very little boy, obviously I wasn't living at the property. When I was being boarded out, May gave Claire authority to go into the Davis and Paxson was our store and to go to the little boy section and buy the very best clothes for me. And Claire never had any money in her purse for all practical purposes. And everything was on credit because Mrs. Goodrum had credit accounts everywhere. So it was unusual. Interesting, I ended up working in finance and you know, that's Barred money is what life is about, believe it or not. Not cash. Almost everything is done on credit. And the credit card, the Federal Reserve had to shut down banks because people weren't writing checks anymore to the degree they did. Uh, they had the che Every check has to be go through the, manually used to go through the system. But once people went to credit cards, they actually fired people from the treasury system because they, they weren't processing checks anymore with the rise. So, so I'm how the credit system has evolved and that's one of my fields. Credit, credit. Can you talk a little bit about your life in the little house and do you remember the first day you moved in? Mm -hmm. Do you remember, what do you remember about the little house and your life in there? Well, the, my house, the little, it was a lovely thing. A lovely thing they did for us. And it, it, the idea was we don't know exactly because Tad has discovered the plans to build an addition either onto the back side of the main house or a, an addition to the garage. That they have to have the plans for that. Shutsy drew the plans. And so and then that was discarded. And remember, I'm overseas. I'm in private steel and I'm fighting in the Pacific. And they were decided that not only that, I think in addition to the house, it was so I would have my own room. They built a little room in the back of the, the little house. That room, in the beginning there wasn't, when the house was built, it didn't have that back section. That was when it was, it was built while I was away to give me my own room when I came home. Wasn't that a nice gesture? And so, do you remember as a little boy your first time moving into the house with Bob and Clara? No. No. It probably wasn't too important because we'd made the main the main shift was getting the apartment before the house. Clara conned me into getting them in the, and so she would have regular working hours. See, we lived at Five East Wesley, which is right at the corner of it's at Dead Man's Curve. You know that area? So we uh, we established the remember Clara married Clara married Bob mainly for me. She loved Bob. They had a great love affair, but it's not necessary to have a love affair and be married. Not necessary to be married. So she wanted me to have a father. So so we established the tr a nuclear family at Five East Wesley. In the, it's a second floor apartment, and they're very nice. And uh, I was a student at E River School in the fifth grade. So then I think we were there about a year, and then there was the little, the, the little house was 
built and uh, we moved in there. So I'm sure as a child, I, I doubt if I appreciated what a nice thing it was. But it was a very well done. They put a lot of thought into it. And Do you remember where you slept and where you played? Yeah. I slept in the living room on a couch. We, we made up a bed. When it was time for me to go to bed, we made up a bed on the couch. No. You know, I remember I came from, that was a very luxury for me because I'd been, the main thing I wanted to get back with my mother because I was a, a young child. So it, it was very nice. I had a wonderful life there. Uh, there was a separate telephone system. Did I, is that worth mentioning? Absolutely. Uh, it wasn't used much, but when they designed, when, when Shutsy or the telephone engineers were thinking about it, they got a regular phone system in the house. But in those days, apparently, well, there's going to come. And so Clara, the number one servant, is going to be living in the little house, which is 50 yards away from the big house. So there's going to be times when May wants Clara. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, there apparently wasn't any system where they could just put in an extension. Well, one thing that would ring in a May's regular business would ring in our house. And you wouldn't want that, right? You wouldn't want the Abrea phone system ringing in the servant's house. So they installed a completely new phone system, which Tad has all the paperwork on, by the way. Tad is a great researcher. But we didn't use it much. Claire was at the house almost all the time. She just came down to sleep. She really worked all the time, and May got a bargain. Even though she did a lot for us, she got a bargain. Uh, there was a kitchen in the little house. Do you remember your mother cooking in it at all, or did you? Yeah, Clara had, had a lot of her life, life and a lot of our life was bent, bent, bent or built around ideas that she had in her head that she wanted to make come true. She wanted to have a husband and, and her son and jobs and a house. And she got all of that, step by step, <laughs> job by job, little boy, house, husband, everything's fine. And every, when, when she died, everything had been achieved. I'm sure Clara never had money as a goal. I doubt if she ever thought about it. Did she have any hobbies or anything that she liked to do on her downtime or time off? Did she, did you listen to the radio? Did you go to the movies? Is there anything that you remember? Yeah. In the 1930s, which was the time we were in the property, most of the time, uh, except for the early 40s, uh, the very concept of Hollywood in the movies was very big in America, much bigger than it is today. Uh, all the major distributors, say there's half a dozen major studios in Hollywood, each of them had a distribution theater in every major city. And they tried to have change the movie every week. And Americans really liked to go to the movies every week. And there was, the system was designed to have a new movie coming into the Fox Theater, the, the Lowe's Grand Theater, uh, the Paramount Theater, the Capitol Theater, the and we went to all those. And going to the movies was a big part of life in those days. So we did that, and uh, mother, mother liked to do those. And ma, mother and Bob Cody, her husband, and uh, my eyes a little child, we, we would go to the movies uh, on our off time. And uh, money was such a small account, as I said, I don't think Clara actually was paid in money. She could buy anything on May's account, uh, just as you can for your, the job you have. Uh, she really didn't need it. Did she knit? Did she do anything with her downtime? Do you remember her doing any sewing, sewing or? No, we went to the movies. Every, and not only us, but all America went to the movies. Now, the smaller towns would like to have one movie, where Atlanta, being the biggest city in the South, they had half a dozen. 
And so another big thing was Life magazine. That's the way the country uh, kept in touch. It was a big thing. The Leica camera had just been invented. That was the first uh, cameras used to have the big Graflex, the news photographers. So uh, once the little tiny 35 and like a 35 millimeter was invented, then at the same time, uh, a very smart guy, uh, rich guy, uh, Henry Luce, uh, created a company called Time Life. And at the same time, which is of course even today a big corporation, uh, they, uh, something else was invented. It was a high-speed, low-cost magazine printing machine. So he invented Time Magazine and Life Magazine and had printing and distribution plants on the East Coast and the West Coast in St. Louis. So he, he got the, news, the week's news out that week. That was prior to that, there was nothing current. And he brought America current in the Life Magazine brought pictures. Today, you've seen the statistics on how many hours a day people watch TV? I think it's eight hours a day. Some men and men watch it on weekends, baseball, football, year round, and the women watch the soap operas. The television was very influential, but so it was a long way off. But uh, the movies played that role, plus Life magazine, which came out about 1935. So. That was a big thing in those days. Clara, Clara's work, work and time off was almost the same thing. And she didn't have any money, and we've got pictures of her, and what, what she liked to do. What did Clara like to do? Let's phrase it that way. Okay. I think she took half a day off on Saturday, or maybe all day, but maybe just half a day. She was committed to the house. A magazine, we think, is almost a throwaway item today. Go into a store and buy a magazine. It's almost like it's not important. Buying a magazine is not important in today's culture. Uh -huh. Clara, on a no-money life, Saturday mornings, we'd get in the car, she and I. We've got pictures of it. They had sidewalk photographers. We would go to a second-hand magazine store and pay 15 cents for an old magazine. And they would wrap it up in brown paper with a string, and the picture she's carrying it in her hand, that shows the level of the economic system at the time. Uh, today, uh, in finance, we use the word liquid. The, 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 uh, there's massive amounts of cash and credit floating around in America. And it wasn't in those days. The government has printed it's credit rather than dollar bills, but created money to be spent. And so that's one of the reasons we have this high level that we're at today, a high level of business. But things were at a low level of activity. And so a 15 cent, here's Claire at the bottom of the job market. Her, her pleasure is buying a used magazine for 15 cents. Uh, she didn't have any hobbies. It was unusual. The question zeroes right in on where today we make a big deal out of our free time. When you evaluate a new job, you say, well, how, much, how many hours am I going to work? And Clara never said that. She worked every day, all day. Can you talk a little bit about those photographers? I know that we have three uh, or four. Oh, is somebody checking the clock? Oh, we're not going anywhere. Are we? no, you want to walk out this door at 1130? Is, is that our schedule? Where so talk about a little bit about the photographers that would be on the street, because I know we have three or four of those photographs of you and your mom and your mom with Mrs. Beverly walking on the street. And how did that work? They would come up to you? No, they had a position, and you walked by them. Uh, right, the main intersection for downtown shop, if you, if you were, Atlanta was connected by the streetcar system. And everyone would go to like, get off at Davis and Paxton or get off at Richards, the two parts of the city. And so everyone went there. And also, by the way, the, the only people on the streets were white. That, that was the system in those days. And you never thought of, you never thought about it. You never thought about it. Minority people, they had jobs. And that's where you saw them. 
and then they disappeared. And you see them on the transportation. So that was a big difference. So uh, that was just a sidebar that uh, I think that they didn't have the, the Polaroid instant photography was a long way off. And I, th I think you, they would probably give you a card, say like uh, have your number on a 1648-52, and you mail that in with a, some money. I don't know how they did it, but we have at least three pictures, and, and people did it all the time, so it must have been convenient. But it was a nice thing, and it shows how devoted I was to my mother, because when on her day off, I went with her. I'm not letting you out of my sight. <laughs> Our boy and his mother, you already know about that. that I do. And when, when, you, when you, you notice when you, sometime during football season, if you might be watching a high school game or go to, the, the players come over and say, hi, mom, don't they? Do they ever say, hi, dad? <laughs> no. <laughs> mom is number one. So on that night in 1947 when they brought me home to tell me my mother was dead, so that you know, I I had never thought about my life in the future. So then my, you know, I would probably ended up driving a Coca-Cola. Don't you think it's sometime May might have picked up the phone and called Bob Woodruff and said, we got this nice little boy here. He just got back from fighting the war. He's Clara's son. Why don't you give him a job of driving a Coca-Cola truck? That, that, to me, that's a much more rational, logical thing for the way my life could have gone as to the way it did go. Did your mother ever talk about you going to college or no. when that happened? No. Did the two of you talk about it or no. did she realize what a big step that was? No, because college wasn't part of the English experience and she found out if she even thought about it. And Claire Did and I didn't, talk? we didn't have a lot of talks. She was not a big talker. I'm the talker. She's not. So, but mainly she was a, a, a as you are, your mothers are, a, 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 a very, you were formative in the first place. And then once we grow up, then you're still influential. We still live your values. When I hear these things like, oh, Teenage rebellion. What are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. In, a, in the generation that I'm from, the pre-World War II teenagers in Buckhead, there was no such thing as a bad boy. A bad, there was no such thing as crime in Buckhead. They had one police car that was assigned to Buckhead, and the name of the police officer was Cates, Officer Cates, and he never made an arrest because there was never any crime. He just drove around, he had his arm out of the window and waving at everybody. What happened, so I ask you, what happened to this country? You, you can't build enough jails until the 2008 recession down here. The state of Florida used to build a new state prison every year. You know, drugs has taken over the country. That's, drugs has brought crime to every, the smallest village. It, it, it's, it's there. Why do you think that, I know that May had a night watchman. Why did she have a night watchman? Yeah, if you felt like there was no crime, what was it about it that? Good point, in particular since the, Mr. Boyd did have a pistol and it was in the drawer, kept in the drawer in, in his room, at that room at the top of the back stairs. In the military, they must have had at some time in the past a barracks catch on fire that had 30, 40 sailors, soldiers, Marines in it that got burned up. That must have happened. Sooner or later, a barracks must have caught on fire. So the military evolved something called a fire watch. That is, whenever there's a group of men sleeping, you're always one person awake. It's a duty assignment. In a barracks, they would always have one person so in case of the fire, so Mr. Morgan was really, a, I think, a fire watch. Uh, they did, but these days, I think it was a good thing, locking the gates up at night. It just seems like a good idea, even in those days. But one thing on that property, that there, was some, there was never a prowler, never the slightest 
anything. And everyone was very formed by obedience to a law. America was a law and order society. And everyone accepted it. And boy, it works. We didn't build prisons every year. We didn't have crime shows, all that. I mean, something happened really bad to this country. It became more modern and, and a lot of wonderful things, but we lost a lot as the, 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 the good side of the culture didn't prevail. I think I can think of anything others. Uh, do we want to emphasize the people of the property? Mrs. Goodrum w was the queen of that house, and her desk and her chair was her throne. And she conducted, uh, uh, she was almost always sitting behind her desk, and people came in to see her. And so she was, uh, she was a very efficient businesswoman. When the time came, we, we all held her in sort of awe. Even though I was one of the group, shall we say, I never made any attempt to, shall we say, be familiar to her. I instinctively knew to keep my distance. I instinctively knew there was something different. Remember, I'm, I'm this, at the beginning, I'm this high. And Claire just mothered bringing me home on weekends. And somehow or another, May was made special dispensations for the little child. So she was a grand lady of the house. They didn't entertain a lot, but when they did, it was for really big people. They would bring big name politicians and people from Washington. They would entertain them. I'm trying to think of anything that might have omitted. Christmas wasn't a big deal at the house. Uh, since there were no children, there's, there's many of them. In, in the early years, it was just Molly and May and myself and my mother. So in most families, Christmas is a big deal. I can't think of anything else. They had a lot of cars, three or four cars all the time. Two full chauffeurs, and then when Peter got his own chauffeur, three full-time chauffeurs. That's a lot. No, I guess it would be two because May would, Molly would be gone by then. A dog property, a lot of dogs. Kindness, kindness was uh, a great trait. And uh, for people in power to have it, May and Clara had the power on that property and they were kind people to all the junior people. No one was ever, you know, I'm around them all. They never complained. No, the servants never complained. And they were treated well. So I think all, all of us had a wonderful time. Times were good in those days. Um, and it all came to an end on, with a big surprise. And everybody had to reconfigure. Is that the word these days? Reconfigure. Are we done? I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. This has been a delight.